So So then the second step is to have this other bromine attack the harmonium ion. And that's sort of an SN2-like mechanism. That means that it's going to invert the configuration. So there is that the bromine that was already attached stays on that wedge bond, whereas the bromine that just attacked is on the dash bond. So this is what we call the anti addition And then we're going to have an anti along with that as well, because the bromine could also attack over here instead. That's the mechanism for the addition of BR2 to cyclohexene. When we say pay attention to stereochemistry, we want to make sure that it's an anti addition. All right, questions about that one? Can't see the dots. Okay, I'll make the dots uh, darker, bigger next time. Is the first one SR? You mean this one here? The one on the, the like the the molecule that we drew on the left here. Um, no, this one should be RR. Wait. Yeah, RR. In general, when you make this type of a structure, this type of a cyclohexane, um, where you have a, a wedge and a dash, and then the enantiomer, that one of them is going to be RR, one of them is going to be SS, and then the meso compound is the SR or the RS. Yeah, the bromine on dashes is R. Let's take a look at that. So we've got the bromine is going to get the first priority. Then we've got these two carbons. Um, this carbon gets priority because it's connected to the bromine. And then this one, and then the hydrogen is four. So that's one, two, three, but the hydrogen's in the front, so we have to flip it. So that's R. Okay. And then this one, one, two, three, bromine's on the wedge, so it's also R. Other questions? All right, let's move on. The ammonium ion has a lower pKa than the methyl ammonium ion. So we've got ammonium at 9.25, methyl ammonium at 10.66. Which is the stronger base, ammonia or methyl amine? Explain. All right, so when we're looking at stronger these types of questions, stronger acid, stronger base, we have to make sure that we um, are answering the correct question. Because right? um, this is something that I've talked to several of you about at different times about like, you've got the right logic, but you end up making the wrong conclusion because you're thinking about the acids instead of the bases or something. So um, let's take a look at what we're dealing with here. We've got the ammonium ion, which has a pKa of 9.25, and its conjugate base is ammonia. And then we've got methyl ammonium, and its conjugate base is methyl amine, and this one's pKa is 10.66. All right, so from looking at the pKa's, the most obvious question to answer is the stronger acid. So can you tell which one the stronger acid is?
Yeah, NH4, it's got the lower pKa, right? So we might just um, write that here just to keep ourselves, just to, to remind ourselves that, that we know that, um, just to keep everything organized. So this is going to be the stronger acid. And here's the weaker acid. All right. Yes, so that's exactly right. So going back to the question, when it says, which is the stronger base, the acid and the conjugate base strength are always opposite. So the stronger acid is going to be with the weaker base. And the weaker acid gives the stronger base. Right. So the answer for this one is that methylamine is the stronger base because it's the conjugate base of the weaker acid. All right. Any questions about that one? Right. Um, by the way. Uh, no, you don't have to submit this discussion. We're just this is just for review and, and for going over it. Um, if if by the way, if this typing in the chat thing is working fine for you, that's fine. But if um, if you'd rather just unmute yourself and ask questions by voice, that's also fine. So um, just jump in. There's only eleven of us here, so it should be pretty easy to manage if if you want to. Uh, talk. But if you don't, that's fine, too. All right. Um, let's move on, then. Propose a mechanism for this reaction and account for its regioselectivity. All right. So this is, this is an interesting question because it's different from any mechanism that we've seen. So we have to figure out the mechanism of this one. Uh, a little bit. We have to we have to submit a, or find a mechanism for this, even though this isn't something we can just look up in our book. Um, so we would say here's our our first starting molecule, and then it's going to react with ICL. Can you see those lone pairs any better? All right, great, thank you. Um, okay, so ICL is not a molecule that we've dealt with before. So how do you how do you do this? What what can you um, what can you use that you do know to compare to this one? Yes, take away the double bond, but what? But we need to actually draw a mechanism. So what? What do we mean by take away the double bond? What do we draw here? Arrow. Yes, thank you. Arrow from the eye. So yes, close. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that we're using our that we're kind of classifying this reaction the way that we have before. So this is still. I got a letter there. This is still alkene addition. Okay. Just like the other alkene addition reactions that we've looked at. So we need to draw a mechanism that is a correct alkene addition mechanism, just like the other alkene addition mechanisms we've drawn. So those always start from the alkene and attack the um, Molecule. Now, our, I guess I sort of uh, jumped a little too far forward here. Why, why did I know that, this, that the alkene is supposed to attack the I and not the CL? There's really two answers to this question. OK, interesting idea. So the slight negative, uh, I is bigger. Yeah. Um, in this case, no POS. I'm going to assume that's positive and not 
something else. Um, yeah, so uh, in this case, this is a polar bond. So we could say, yeah, we expect that we know that chlorine is more electronegative than iodine. So there's some polarity there. So the I is going to be more electrophilic. So that's one way to say it and say, oh, yeah, the I is going to be more electrophilic. So the double bond attacks the I because the double bond is the nucleophile. Um, the other way to do it is to use the information that you're already given. So like in this example, we see um, that the I ends up on the less substituted carbon over on the end. The Cl ends up here on the more substituted carbon. So that means that, um, that if we're assuming that this is like an HX type situation, so the thing that gets attached, attacked first ends up on the less substituted side so that the carbocation can be over here because the tertiary carbocation will be more, um, will be more stabilized. Uh, so if we complete this mechanism for the step of the mechanism, we want to make that tertiary carbocation Right, which means our iodine is going to be here so that the carbocation can be there. So again, when we're looking at a new mechanism or something that's a little bit different, we want to go back to that mechanism that we know, the HX mechanism, and make sure we're following basically the same thing just with these different elements. So it follows in the same way, just with different elements. And so that means that our um, CL is still there. chloride now, which is now a chloride. And so we can complete the mechanism by having the chloride attack at the carbocation. All right, so that's our final product that is given here. Um, some so sometimes you have to, like, you're just given some reactants and you have to find the product and find the mechanism. But if you're given the products and the, or the reactants and the products, then you know where you're going to end up. So you just have to figure out how, how are the arrows going to proceed to get you to that point. And the key there is don't make anything up. If, if I'm asking you, or if the book is asking you or whatever, to propose a mechanism, you can assume that it's based on something that you've that you've already done. Um, that it's that it's going to be analogous to something that we've already done, and you shouldn't be making up new steps of like arrows flying in from wherever. Um, it, it should follow pretty closely with something that you've already done. So in this case, exactly the same arrows as HX alkene addition. Excuse me, um, but uh, the difference being that there's just different elements there. The, the actual mechanism is the same. All right, any questions about that? If you look over, uh, just looking at the exam, so there are a couple of mechanism questions that are very straightforward, just like exactly the same as we've done. And then there's one that's a little bit trickier and different. Um, so that is B, uh, sorry, uh, five, page five B. So take a little time to work on that one. Uh, that one might take you a little bit more time. Remember again, you don't need to make up anything here. Um, there, it, it is analogous to other stuff. It's just gonna take a little bit of uh, thinking. Okay. Next, try the mechanism of the SN2 reaction involving R2-chlorobutane with NASH to produce S2-butane thiol. What? 5E? There is no five. Oh, wait. There 
There's no 5e. Section three, part eight, let me see. Oh, no, 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 sorry, five B, five B is in boy. I think it's an interesting question, and if you've done the homework, um, you've done something similar, but I'll, I'll, I'll grade it generously. But it's always good to have a challenge, right? Okay, um, let's take a look at this mechanism then. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Uh, number 24, draw the mechanism of the SN2 reaction involving R2-chlorobutane with NASH to produce S2-butane thiol. Explain the stereoselectivity of the reaction. Okay, so let's draw it first. 2-chlorobutane. Um, again, if uh, you want to draw a particular stereoisomer and you want it to only be that stereoisomer, um, what I would do is draw, just pick one first. So I'm just randomly picking the wedge. I don't know if this is going to be R or S. And then I'm going to evaluate it. And if it's wrong, I just flip it. So one, two, three, that's actually right. So I can leave it as is. But if I had drawn a dash, then I would just flip it. All right, so there's R2-chlorobutane. And then NASH, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we talked about this before, but when we have uh, counter ions like sodium, we know that's not really participating in the reaction. It's just in solution. So it's actually OK to just not draw it. You can draw it if you want. But we know that this reaction is focusing on the SH nucleophile, right? hydrosulfide. So that's, that's what we're going to focus on. And so the SN2 uh, mechanism looks like that. And then because it's SN2, the SH is coming from the opposite side of the chloride. And so the product is this. Oops. And then a byproduct might be chloride, which again, you don't always have to draw the byproducts. Um, what we care about is, is this product. So the, the product is S2-butane thiol, which is that. And then explain the stereoselectivity of the reaction, what I just said. In an SN2 reaction, um, because it's happening at the same time, you have a transition state where the SH is coming in behind and the chloride is leaving. So they have to be sort of attached at the same time. Um, and so that way you end up flipping that configuration. Um, yeah. Questions about that? And then the last one here, there is an overall 29-fold difference in reactivity or reaction rate of 1-chlorohexane, 2-chlorohexane, and 3-chlorohexane toward potassium iodide in acetone. So what, what is going on here? Uh, all right, so let's draw these. Two chlorohexane, three chlorohexane. Okay, and we're going to react each of these. With 
Ki and acetone. A reaction is that. What, what what sort of reaction is that likely to be? Then two. Yes, thank you, Irina. Yeah, that's in two. Uh, how do you know? Yeah, so you've got primary secondary substrates with a good nucleophile iodide and uh, an aprotic solvent. So everything kind of comes together to be SN2 here. Okay. All, all factors point to SN2. So which one is the fastest? One. Agree? Disagree? First one, yep, you're all correct. So why is the first one the fastest? Yes, primary substrate, right? So primary substrates are going to be fastest uh, for SN2. Not for SN1, but for SN2. Yes. Okay, great. So if the first one's the fastest, then um, it says two of the isomers differ by only a factor of two in reactivity. So which of the other two, or, or, or which two do you think will only differ by a little bit instead of a lot? Yeah, the two secondary ones, right? So, so these two ha have the same, basically the same environment to react. Um, now, everything's always a little bit different. It's never identical, but they're going to be similar. So we would expect that these two are going to be pretty similar. And so uh, which one of those two is more reactive and why? Well, what do you think? If one of them, one of them is only a little bit more reactive, so twice as reactive than the other, which one's, which one, the middle one or the one on the right is going to be a little bit more reactive? Yeah, the middle one, why? You're correct. Why? Right, yeah, the placement of chloride, yep. Yeah, exactly. So this one is more kind of toward the middle of the chain. This one's more toward the end. So this one's a little bit more crowded. It's still a secondary substrate, but it's a little bit more crowded than this one um, because it's more toward the middle. So, um, so reactivity wise, we would expect that this one is the fastest by a lot. And this one's a little bit faster than this one. encumbered exactly you like this sparkly it's fun i feel like a unicorn all right so um okay so that ends our review sheet so we've got about uh 40 minutes left would you do you have specific questions do you uh, have uh more broader conceptual things you want to go over um homework questions we all just sort of work on our exams individually a little bit and then uh, ask questions when stuff comes out. I do have the exam up on my other screen here, so I'm, you can't fool me into giving you the exam answers, but I will be happy to help you with concepts or similar homework questions or something like that.
Can we go over reasoning for five again? A discussion, sure. Um, so Steve asks, will the exam problems be gone over after today? Yes. Um, so, yeah, uh, I would expect that, well, I guess, do you mean gone over before turning them in or, or like just go through the exam later with all the answers? Yeah, yeah, we will. So um, after you turn them in, I will grade them, um, which will probably take a while because they'll all be digital and I'll have to figure something out with that and, and give, somehow get, get them back to you. Um, and then we will have a session like this where we'll go through all the answers and, uh, you know, and answer questions. And particularly with this exam, I didn't have a chance to get anybody to review it or anything. So um, if you find things that look like mistakes in the exam, please uh, send me an email today. Um, we may end up throwing out some questions or something if something goes wrong. I don't know. But we'll def I definitely want to go through it so that we have a chance to check through everything. Okay, so a question about number five, which side of the reaction is favored? Um, so we said the product side is favored. Why? In this case, uh, again, we're going to look at the pKa's and judge the relative strengths of the acids. Yep. So just pKa. Um, there's nothing nothing trickier than that. There. We're always going to go to the weakest acids and bases side. So we can figure that out by um, looking at the pKa's of the acids. We've got these stronger acid on the left, the weaker acid on the right. And so we expect the product to go uh, toward the right, toward the weaker acid. Other questions? No, nope, that's it. Oh yeah, good question. Um, so let's go back down to that one with this mechanism. So why was the, that's right, we didn't really account for that. Why was the iodine, why did the iodine end up, end up over here and the chloride end up over here? So the answer is um, because of this, oops, because of this dipole. So when we think about the addition of HX, our, our kind of typical, the very first alkene addition that we learned, we saw that there's a dipole there. The double bond, the alkene is the nucleophile, and this is the electrophile. This is actually technically electrophilic addition. So in electrophilic addition, the nucleophilic alkene attacks the electrophilic H. Since this is analogous to that, we've got the same thing going on. The I is attacked first, and that leaves a carbocation. Now, the I could go to either side, just like the hydrogen could. Because we want to make always make the more stable carbocation, that's going to form faster. The iodide ends up over on this carbon. Uh, leaving the tertiary carbocation. So if the iodide went over here, we would end up with a primary carbocation. We know that's not going to happen. So the iodide goes here, and we have our tertiary carbocation instead. Um, and so that's the one that's open for the chloride to then attack. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, the other thing that can be confusing here is we often think of iodine as a, a good nucleophile. And iodide, the negative ion, is a good nucleophile. But that's not what we're looking at here. This is a different molecule. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with nucleophilic iodide. So 
other questions? Nine, sure. Nine. Yeah. Um so Lindlar's catalyst and then uh, and then number nine. We'll, we'll look at both of those things. So number nine here. Um, yeah, don't get thrown off by crazy shapes. Um, you know, carbon's carbon. Molecules are molecules. They, they can be big, they can be small, but the specific concepts, the reactivity, the leaving groups, nucleophiles, whatever, um, are always the same no matter what's going on in the rest of the giant thing. So um, so here actually is an example of going from a, uh, oh, you mean product to a reactant, like like figuring out what's, yeah, we'll do that too. So in this case, we want, we have multiple steps that we have to work through. Um, so first, the alkyne is going to get deprotonated by the sodium amide, an NH2, which is a strong base. Um, let's... Make this move. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, of course, now I lost this thing. So let's go back up. Okay. Uh, so we've got, you know, yes, there's kind of a, a sh unusual shape here, uh, but that's really no different than. Know, something like this and in fact what we often use and you can do this while you're while you're going through this is this wild card r if it makes you feel better um r just kind of means general carbon stuff and so if you uh if you're getting distracted by some big thing hanging off your molecule just cut it off and put r there um and just focus on the thing that's 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 important so in this case you've got Deprotonation. Um, and then you've got your substitution. So this is going to attack the carbon and substitute off the bromine. Of that, and then you can replace the R at the end with whatever this big stuff was. Okay, so that's one. So let's look at Lindlar's catalyst again. So whenever we have an alkene or an alkyne, sorry, like um, like this, we want to reduce that. If we were to reduce this with a normal palladium catalyst, or sometimes this is written as palladium with carbon, whatever, some sort of metal catalyst with uh, hydrogenation, that reduces all the way down to the alkane. So the reason for that is that this stuff is strong enough 
to also reduce alkenes. So if you end up, you know, if you imagine like the first equivalent of hydrogen makes the alkene, well, it's still there and it's still reactive enough to reduce an alkene, so it's just gonna reduce the alkene. So if you don't wanna do that, then you use Lindlar's catalyst, which is also actually a palladium catalyst, but it has barium sulfate, some other stuff in there that makes it less reactive. So Lindlar's catalyst makes the hydrogen react with alkynes, but not alkenes. So when, after the first reduction to make the alkene, it stops and it does not go on to form the alkane. So it's a way to make alkenes um, from alkynes without making the, uh, the alkane. And it, all, it does have cis selectivity, uh, um, cis hydrogenation. So you end up with the cis alkenes. All right, uh, any questions about that one? Okay, Nicole uh, asks, can we do an example of going from a product to a reactant? So what happens if you have something like um, you have the blank to start with, and then you have some, um, is this what you're talking about? Where, where like a, a product is given and you have to come up with, the, with what it came from? Or are you talking about more like you have to come up with the steps of the reactions to build the, the thing? Okay, like this, okay. So, um, all right, so let's let's pick one. Let's see, make sure I don't pick a one that's on the exam by accident. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? Um, Okay, so let's say we have this, um, and we want to know what was the reactant that um, that gets uh, water and acid added to it and gets hydrated to make this. Okay. So the first thing is to think about what type of functional group to start with. Um, in this case, adding water with acid to make an OH is um, a type of alkene addition of water, right? H on the one side of the double bond or the other side OH. So, um, so we have to first recognize that that product comes from a, an alkene addition reaction. Um, and so, so you can do that. Maybe you know that, maybe you don't. Uh, for this exam, if you don't, you can look it up and just say, okay, what kinds of things make alcohols? Um, oh, or, or OHs, oh, alkene additions is really all we've, we've seen so far. Um, also substitutions, I guess, but... Um, That's not really acid catalyzed. You, you need more like neutral water or NaOH or something to do sub, excuse me, substitution. So, so we're thinking we're going to end up with a double bond. So then the other thing to keep in mind is whatever your first choice is may not be right. So let's say, oh, okay, um, I know that this is alkene addition. So I'm going to make my alkene addition like that. And then the OH will add here, and I'll get this product. What's wrong with that? Why, 
Why is that not the best answer here? Well, the double, we have to start with the double bond, but, but yes, what about the double bond is wrong here? It's the wrong spot. The reason it's the wrong spot is that this would be one of the products, but this reaction would not be selective because both of those sides of the double bond are, are tertiary centers. So you would expect to get an even mixture of this, the product you want, but also this one, because there's no difference to the, to the reagent between those two sites. They both make tertiary carbocations. So that's, a, that's not a selective reaction because you don't want to do a reaction where you're going to make half of what you want and half of, of not what you want. Um, so there's a better choice, right? The better choice is to put the double bond one carbon over because now there's a clear difference between the two sides of the double bond. The, the cation's not going to go here because that would be a secondary cation. The cation's going to go here and that way we can make sure that the OH ends up right there and not, not over uh, here. Now, um, this is actually not a great question because in real life, uh, because of carbocation shifts, you actually would get some trading back and forth and you would make this product regardless. Um, but if we can start with this one and maybe we can control the conditions so that we're not getting hydride shifts um, to, to switch the carbocation around, maybe we can make it work. But um, this is still the better, the better solution there. So does that make sense? Good. Yeah, so you got to figure out what type of reaction is going on so that you know what kind of substrate to start with. And then how, where are you going to put the functional group to make sure that, that you get the best product? One more thing as I'm looking at the exam. So the very last page um, asks you to do some of these synthetic transformations. Um, and it says one of them is extra credit. It, it, it's, not like a, it's not like a mystery. Um, there's just three extra points in that part. So one of them is extra, you know. So you get three extra points. Basically, you can, you can choose not to do one, or you can just do them all and, uh, and hope you get more points, extra points. Uh, difference between an enantiomer and diastereomer. Yeah, good question. Does anybody have a good way of uh, remembering those? One is the same, the other is opposite. Um, if that works for you, that's great. Uh, that seems a little, maybe a little too broad. The antimers are um, always mirror images, but not, we, the word we used was superposable or superimposable. Um, which is another way of saying not the same. So yeah, hands is a good way to remember that. Um, your hands are All right, this is going to look terrible. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm not gonna try hands. You know what hands look like, right? Your hands are, uh, yeah, your hands are uh, not not the same, but they're mirror images of each other. Um, so these are stereo isomers that are mirror images but are not the same. Um, so, for example. We looked at like these, this one, and it's an antimer. If we draw its mirror image, those are mirror images, but they are not the same because if you flip one over, it's not superposable. It's not the same as the other one. Um, but where we have to be a bit careful on this is watching for the meso compounds. Right, so things that are say something like that. So this one, if we draw its mirror image, right, it has it has that symmetry. We can we can notice it right away from the, the line of symmetry down the middle. Um, and if we draw the the mirror image. You end up you end up with the exact same thing, um, and so you end up some, with something that is actually the same. So it doesn't fit that, that definition of being not the same. Um, and so diastereomer then is any stereoisomers that are not. Mirror images. Any stereoisomers that are not mirror images are diastereomers. So that would be things like, so if we go back to this example, and remember that this is a this these words represent relationships. So you need at least two of these to have this relationship. So let's say we like change that bottom bond to a dash, those are now uh, stereoisomers still, but they're not mirror images. Whoops, I didn't mean to put that OH in there. They're not mirror images. They're stereoisomers, um, but not mirror images. And so they're diastereomers. This also uh, works for double bonds. So cis and trans double bonds or E and Z double bonds are also diastereomers of each other because they are stereoisomers but they're not mirror images. And then the other thing to remember about uh, enantiomers versus diastereomers is that enantiomers will generally have the same, will always have the same physical properties. So things like melting point, boiling point, polarity. So they're very, very difficult to separate because you can't use any of the typical techniques, you know, um, separating by like um, distillation or uh, TLC, looking at polarity. They're always going to behave the same. So that's why a racemic mixture, a mixture of two enantiomers, is considered achiral. You've got a mixture of both of them, and they're going to behave the same in pretty much any solution. The only way they differ is an interaction with other chiral things. Um, diastereomers will generally have different physical properties. So they'll have different melting points, different boiling points, polarities. Sometimes you can crystallize one out from the other one. Um, you can separate them by chromatography, uh, all that. All right, page five. Four. So you mean the, the 
one about separating the products of the reaction. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you've got a mixture of two products, um, and it needs to be separated. And you're going to separate those via extraction. So using a separatory funnel, how are you going to get those things separated? Um, so uh, think about the lab that we did where we separated things via extraction. This is not the exact same as that, but it's the same ideas. So uh, keep in mind that charged charged molecules, so negative and positively charged molecules, will dissolve in water, but neutral organic molecules generally won't. So you can use that to separate them. Um, I think if you go back and take a look at that lab, uh, the directions and, and the results from that lab, um, and kind of think about what's happening there, that will help lead you to the answer. Does that make sense? Um, kind of both. Uh, I, I want you, I want to know what you're planning to do, like like explain your, your strategy or what you're going to do. Um, but it may also be helpful to draw some diagrams, to draw a picture, to draw chemical structures. Um, you know, develop a plan. I don't. I'm not requiring that you draw specific things, uh, but however you can best explain your plan. An energy diagram is, um, the, the book might call that something different, but it's the uh, reaction coordinate diagram is another name for that. So you've got your um, you know, energy, the reaction progress, and then you know it does whatever it does, depending on the reaction. You know what I'm talking about there? So you've got um, different steps. You know, you got to have a hump, hump for each step and at different activation energies and all that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So that's what that is. All right, we got about two minutes left. Um, I was thinking also, as long as we're all here, do you want me to check back with you sometime this afternoon um, in case you have more questions about the exam as you're going through it? Um, okay, what uh, should we do like? So what happens is I've noticed in the evenings at my house, I guess because everybody's home and watching TV, um, the my bandwidth starts to get really bad and, and the internet starts to cut out. So if we could do maybe like um, like three or four, does that work? I'm sure you all have many plans, but yeah, okay. Um, okay, let's plan on three if you want. Um, you certainly don't have to be here, um, but if you have any questions and you want to Ask them. I'm still not going to tell you the answers, but I'd be happy to clarify things and, and kind of um, hopefully make things a, a little bit clearer. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'll, if you want to come by, I'll see you at 3. Uh, otherwise, I hope the exam goes well. And uh, stay safe and healthy and keep away from everybody. Oh, uh, do you want us to label the specific reactants or products on the energy diagram? No, in that question, um, I just want the, the, just the diagram. So if you want to label them, that maybe makes it easier if it's wrong for me to give you partial credit if I can see what you're doing wrong. But I'm mostly just grading on the, um, on the shape of the curve.
curve. All right, I will uh, see you then. See you later. And send me emails if you have questions before that too.